with that, I am open for any questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Um, I'll just get everything set up here. Sure. We did have uh, one question during your presentation. Um, and you did touch on it a bit, but perhaps you could go into more detail. I'm just going to stop your screen share. So the first question is, could you please clarify why your study didn't include birds? My study has already taken on more than we can chew. <laughs> In certain aspects, um, most wildlife studies, they focus on one species or one group of species. Um, I am taking on many more species than that. So, and I'm the only person doing this work. I work independently, I work solo. I do all of the field work, data collection, sorting, organizing, tagging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I can only manage, you know, as much as I can manage. So I, that's why I am unable to unfortunately include the birds in my actual analysis. Um, but I do, like I said, tag them and archive them. So they are there for future researchers or scientists to utilize um, if they would like. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Scoping, um, uh, managing your expectations. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, boundaries. <laughs> We have another, is your study continuing? Yes, it is. So I'm doing this work um, for at least another year and a half. I will be doing three full years of monitoring before I have to pass it off and start working on, you know, writing my thesis and doing my analyses and those fun things. But I am setting up um, the framework of this study to be very long term. So when we, when we communicate and, and talk about this in my various groups and committees, uh, our, you know, long-term plans are 30 to 50 years minimum, uh, hopefully much longer than that. The, one of like the key uh, kind of reasons for this study is to look at long-term trends over time. Like, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are certain ways that animals are almost evolving differently in cities than we see in wild areas. And so to really be able to understand what that means, um, we need this long, long-term data. And so that is one of kind of the big overarching goals of this project is to be at least 30 to 50 years, but I'll only be here for the next one and a half. <laughs> Uh, okay. I actually have a question. Uh, someone has raised their hand. So I'm going to, Renata, allow you to talk. I'll uh, ask you to unmute. And um, if you want, you can, you can share your, your question with us now. If you turn on your mic, we should be able to hear you. Or you can type it into the chat if you're having trouble. But um, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, could you touch more a little bit on the technical aspects of the cameras and prices, just to give us an idea of how important your work is and how laborious as, is that too? I work a little bit with imaging uh, regarding uh, fish dams before mm -hmm. and watching all those tapes was like brutal. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know how uh, those cameras actually work for wildlife. I haven't uh, worked with that. Do they give you, uh, do you have to uh, sort through all the photos yourself and then make yourself the identification? Do you have experts for that? Mm -hmm. And on the note of the longer term that you just mentioned that you expect the project to last, yeah. uh, how much is the life of a camera like that? Do they have to be replaced very often? How much that costs? Just just to give an idea about the importance of your work too. Thank sure, you. Yeah, absolutely. There was like a, a lot of questions bundled into one question. So I will do my best. <laughs> um, I, I did purposely leave out a lot of the technical aspects of my study design. Um, I wanted to communicate this work to a variety of people at a variety of different uh, levels of, of learning and understanding. So, um, but I absolutely can speak to that. Um, I do this work alone. 
Um, as I said, we we did have those uh, the initial supplies donated by the forestry farm, but each camera unit um, costs approximately two hundred and fifty dollars, and that's for the um, individual camera itself. That doesn't include all of the extra supplies, um, which are like I don't know. I don't really want to nickel and dime it, but for an individual camera station, I would approximate it at around three hundred and fifty dollars to four hundred dollars. Um, we yeah we use lithium batteries as well which are expensive and and so yeah we'll say maybe four hundred dollars per camera site so I have thirty of them set up around the city um, I have not had a camera stop working on its own yet <laughs> um, as I said I have had several thefts I've had a couple smashed cameras for no reason um, a lot of people yeah we won't get into that. Um, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. No, it's, it's <laughs> fine. Some people <laughs> just want to watch the world burn. That's it's exactly fun. it. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, it's life expectancy. That's what I was saying. Thank you, Megan. Um, so I would say like three to five years. Um, they are up year round. A lot of other UN studies do seasonal um, camera monitoring. So they put cameras up uh, for one month at a time, four times a year, so to see the different seasons. So we've already extended our um, period of study like three times more than, than all the other UN studies. So it's hard to say exactly in these beginning phases how long these are gonna last. Um, you know, There's also certain things in, in cities, like we get a lot of dust storms because we don't have a lot of vegetation in certain areas. So that gets stuck in the cameras and then we get filled up and, and that kind of stuff. So. It's definitely something that I have to kind of, you know, figure out on the go a lot of the time. I don't even know what a site is going to look at like until I arrive at that site and I walk up to the camera and I go, oh, thank God it's still here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, yeah. a quick follow up question. Are they motion sensitive or are they just running all the time? They are uh, motion activated. Yeah. So. Uh, something moves in front of it and it gets triggered. I have them set to take a burst of three photos every time they're triggered. And that allows me to have some leeway for identification, um, which I do all of the identification on actually. I do, I do all of, I do all of it. So um, I do have access to that UN database though. So I can upload all of my photos into that um, and then tag them through that, which helps me because that database pulls the metadata um, from it. But but yeah, it is it is largely a, a individual project. <laughs> I hope that hit all your points. Sorry, if if I missed something, please please let me know. <laughs> totally did. Thank you. Okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> um. All right. Scrolling back up, someone has noted that their experience with jackrabbits has become uh, is that they have become more common in the last five years. Is that true? Is there a reason why they would increase? Do you have any insights about these populations? Anything like that to share? Yeah, so again, I've only had cameras up for a year and a half. So I don't actually even know what a multi-year you know, population boom looks like um, here in the city. I would say though, um, it, it likely has to do with lack of predation. So um, a lot of the spots where our jackrabbits are hanging out, coyotes just don't have access to. So that is kind of their biggest predator. Um, and when obviously when they are spatially um, isolated from these predators and there's no check or control on these populations and we have lots of, of wonderful vegetation around the city um, to sustain them. So um, it, it isn't surprising to me at at all that their numbers are increasing. There will be some sort of threshold somewhere um, where they just can't maintain themselves in these small areas and the resources that we have, which are very limited in cities, but we don't know what that, what that threshold is yet, so. <laughs> Related, there's a question here. Uh, is the city making efforts to reduce the populations of some of these animals that you're, you're tracking and studying? I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I can't speak to that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, ooh, do you have a favorite picture or moment that you've captured so far? <laughs> I, I have a whole folder 
uh, entitled Cool Picks. <laughs> <laughs> As <laughs> you should. Yes. If you have this volume of data, you should be keeping yes. your fave. <laughs> yeah, so I have, there's like maybe 50 to 60 photos in there of just like really cool, you know, animal poses or goofy things. I get a lot of really interesting jackrabbits. They're very, very personable. Um, I do have like I back up all my data. I have 500,000, 750,000 animal photos um, in total. <laughs> so we, I get a lot of wildlife photos. Like it is very surprising, like the, the huge abundance of animals that we have here in activity that a lot of people don't see. So yeah, really cool stuff. So I do, I put all the best ones in this slideshow. So that's a overview of my cool mix folder. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, what other Canadian city is part of UWIN? UN, yes, that would be um, Edmonton. Yeah, they were the first city to join a couple of, oh gosh. I don't even want to say the date. I'm not sure when they joined. It was before us. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's one of the reasons I do a lot of these presentations and stuff is to get that word out because it is largely um, American. So the other 33 cities are across the States right now. And then just oh, as okay. two Canadian cities. So one of like in this, the urban wildlife information network itself is relatively young still in the grand scope of things. And they are really pushing for, for increased member cities as well as international member cities as well. Um, because we share these protocols and methodology, it cuts out a lot of the um, you know, legwork that needs to be done to make sure that data can be utilized together. Um, so because we share methods, I, you know, we can share data as well relatively simply. So yeah, really cool organization. Uh, yeah. Do your cameras get triggered by domestic animals like fox? And are they considered predators as, as part of this? Or how do you deal with that? Um, I only include domestic animals into my data set if they are very clearly not with human beings. So if there's like a dog um, on a leash, which I get a lot of, you know, people walking their dogs in parks, I lump that into human data and I do not analyze it. I do include, you know, feral type animals. So if I see any dogs that are alone, I will include them. Um, I, we get a lot of cats. I don't really want to go into the cat situation, but we, we get a lot of cats um, at night times um, wandering around. So they are also included in my, in my work. I'm not going to do probably any specific analysis on dogs and cats. Um, I have a lot of other stuff going on, but again, that data will all be there for um, future use. So it, it would be really cool to see um, changes in the number of feral animals that we have or, or those types of things, but that, that uh, data will be there for other people, yeah. We had um, wildlife rehabilitation um, oh geez, what was her name? On a collision, she did a presentation last month on on a collision course um, about bird behavior and how to um, help with the songbird population being decimated by you know building strikes, things like that. Um, and she spoke about the the cats as predators too. So this is a touchy subject I've learned about the cats, outdoor cats. <laughs> That's why I try to avoid it because people have very, like, obviously people have very strong attachments to their pets. Of, of course they do. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it is a fact that cats are the number one killer of songbirds by like, by far. Like if you look at the graph, it's like death by cats is the first one. <laughs> and then it's like death by whatever is the second one. It's like quite a large, a large difference. So Yeah. <laughs> Now there's the data for someone to analyze, thanks to you. Exactly. <laughs> um, have people told you about other animals they've seen? Have you collected any anecdotal stuff? Is that a part of this? No? Um, it's not. Like, I don't, I'm not really using qualitative type data um, in my particular, like, ecological research. 
that being said, I have all sorts of awesome conversations with all sorts of random people on the street <laughs> as I'm like checking my cameras, which are in a lot of really obvious places. Um, I'll get people come up to me and I always welcome it. Please, if you see me out there checking cameras and you have questions or you want to know more or you want to tell me a fun story, like, please do. I, I love hearing that kind of stuff. And, and so, yeah, I get a lot of fun people and a lot of fun, um, fun stories and, and sharing information. And it's been really cool. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, it's fun. On the ground kind of interactions. That's got to be fun. Yeah. And like talking to people that obviously I wouldn't, you know, talk to or get an opportunity to otherwise. And also I've been able to explore like all these different parts of the city that I had never really felt compelled to or knew they were there. So it's really, this project has in a lot of ways I hadn't expected really helped me to connect um, in a lot of ways with the city and also the residents of, of Saskatoon. This isn't my hometown. I come from the Paw Manitoba, um, but I have lived here for a very long time and it, it, it is, you know, essentially my home base now. So it's, it's really awesome getting to, to talk with people here. I, I really enjoy it. Um, related to that, do you meet with other UN researchers and compare notes? What is that like? I don't, Specifically, um, there are a variety of different board, um, you know, committee, uh, whatever things that go on. My supervisor is the one who does all of that and, and who goes to those board meetings and stuff. So they do like they there are, you know, gatherings of the researchers. Um, I don't take part in them in my role right now. Um, but those are where the collaborations occur and um, proposals for using other people's data and, and that type of stuff all comes together in those meetings. And um, we also, uh, we have uh, different conferences that go on yearly as well. So last um, summer there was the um, International Urban Wildlife Conference and there was uh, quite a lot of UN um, researchers and, and people there. And so we were able to meet you know, like this <laughs> digitally or remotely, um, which isn't the best, but obviously we, we take what we can get. Which you can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, um, bef I'll let everyone sort of think of other questions, last minute questions they wanna ask Katie before we go. Um, this presentation is being recorded uh, and will be posted on the Saskatoon Public Library YouTube page. So I'll put the link to our playlist of past presentations into the chat. So if you're interested, you can uh, go and see all of the presentations from the Sustainability Speaker Series over the past two years there. Uh, Katya, do you have anything you'd like to share before we uh, yes. start leaving? Yes, perfect. Um, Yes, I just was going to say that, uh, well, first of all, thanks uh, a lot, Katie, for your very interesting, fascinating presentation. And uh, I see we get a lot of comments uh, from um, people uh, in the chat, uh, everyone also um, complimenting you and uh, happy for this presentation. Um, so our next session will be on May 10th. Uh, it will be by Lisa Holes from Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council. Uh, and the title of presentation will be Considering Compost, Large and Small Scale Options. So it will be kind of comparing uh, small scale, like uh, at the scale of the house compost and uh, uh, at a bigger scale of the landfill. Okay. So hopefully, yeah, a lot of people can join. Yeah, everyone meet back here. <laughs> um, Julia, do you have anything you want to share? Uh, I would like to just echo what Katya said, and thank you, Katie, for a wonderful talk. My heart feels very full knowing how much wildlife there is around Saskatoon. I feel much more connected and in, in, in better company than, than before you started your talk. So thanks for all your lovely photos and uh, for sharing all of that fascinating research with us. Cafe Sai is uh, hopefully gonna be back in Winston's uh, in the fall 2022, but we'll see. So um, if you're interested in our events, just Google Cafe Sai Saskatoon, that Sai is in the first three letters of science or Cafe Sai YXE. 
you'll come up with our Facebook page, possibly our Instagram accounts. And if you want to join the mailing list, cafe sci saskatoon at gmail.com and just say, I want to join. Magically, I will add you. So um, yeah, thank you again. Perfect. And someone, um, the person I had mentioned earlier from last month's presentation is uh, Dan Shattuck of Living Sky Wildlife Rehabilitation. He's the one who spoke about uh, birds uh, and their um, building strike and how to prevent that um, in our environment. So Katie, one last question I have here, actually maybe a couple, but um, someone was curious. At the start of your research, uh, they were curious about whether the River Valley is a vital corridor for wildlife in our city. Taking all into account, do you think it is or is not? I, at this point, would argue that it is the most vital corridor for wildlife in our city. Um, connectivity, as we all know now, <laughs> is massive and huge, and it allows animals to bypass these huge, huge, you know, impediments to movement that we have on the landscape, um, which are our cities, you know, we can drive through them quite easily but when you're a herd of deer or you know whatever and you you reach the border of this city like it's this huge barrier for for movement and and we do have um the city is is working um and putting in a lot of really awesome naturalized parks and areas um that tend to kind of more occur at the periphery and so that is opening up connectivity to some of our interior habitats um but but yeah, by far, I, I would say that the the river corridor is potentially the the most vital corridor in the city that we have for wildlife, and um, that is um, you know evidenced by uh, my diversity indexes that I have been doing, where you know by far the highest diversity index was at that site um, on the river bank. So super super important corridor, and really really important to continue conserving and protecting that area as well as implementing new corridors into the city as well, I think would be also very vital for wildlife um, distribution and enhancing areas of diversity in the city as well. So good question. Thank you, Kenton. And it looks like one last one. Um, where were the mice? Oh, I've seen mice. Um, I see them in some of my <laughs> rural areas. I have a couple, I guess I actually didn't put a picture of them. It's hard to ID mice <laughs> um, on trail cameras, which tend to not be, you know, perfectly focused or in really high quality. Um, so I kind of just take them as mice, um, but they are definitely, I've seen some cool mice photos of them running up trees um, in some of our croplands and um, running across trails fording puddles I've seen. <laughs> so yeah, there are mice. Sorry, I guess I didn't include them in the presentation. Um, Oversight. <laughs> they're like the least, like, you know, exciting part of wildlife here. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, once again, thank you so much. This thank was you. wonderful. Yes.